Hello, welcome to Circle Time, the earliest podcast. I'm Glenn Denny. Now, my guest this week has a PhD in childhood studies and is currently a senior lecturer at Swansea University here in the UK. I'm welcoming to the podcast this week, Dr. Pete King. Pete, welcome. Hey, hey, welcome to yourself as well. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me. It's always nice to have a chat with someone. Oh, it's brilliant. Yeah. So we were just having, just before I started recording, we were just chatting about um, the fact that we were at the International Play Association Conference that was held in Glasgow in 2023. And it, I was, I went to one of your lectures and it was mind blowing and just fascinating. You, you were talking about the play cycle and it was just elements of this resonated with me so much about, you know, how I think in a way play is misunderstood by so many people. Uh, I think, that was the overarching theme with the IPA conferences, like play is paramount, play is king, um, no pun intended. But um, <laughs> it, I think it was that bit that how you can almost take it seriously and like the play cycle through life. So basically, what is the play cycle? Um, right. I mean, if, if, if we strip it back to where it first originated from, then is that um, at another IPA conference um, in Colorado, 1998, um, two uh, who actually did become uh, good colleagues of mine, um, Gordon Starrock and, and Perry Else, they presented this paper called um, Play Work, The Natural Therapeutic Space, and then it got shortened as um, the Colorado paper, because that's where the IPA conference was. And it, I mean, it's, it's, it's a dense conference presentation that they, they provided. However, within it, they talked about this concept called the play cycle. And I think what's really nice about the play cycle is that even though sort of the, 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 the philosophy, the, the background, everything else is quite complicated, um, the actual play cycle is quite simplistic. And mm -hmm. it's simplistic that you can actually observe elements of it in practice and so um they put forward this this concept and it sort of just took off it, it, it was um liked by the practitioners it was liked by the theorists particularly the, the, the developing world of play work which is my background if, if you're not familiar with play work it is supporting children's play in basically a non-educated context. It's about their, their own free time and everything else. But I think what resonated a lot, particularly with the playwork sector, and actually has filtered out, is that the play cycle focuses on the process of play. Mm -hmm. And I think this is where the strength of it is, is that if you focus on the process rather than the outcome, then you can apply the play cycle to any context where there's play. Mm -hmm. If you focus on the outcome, this is where often it can become more the adult agenda as opposed to supporting play as a child agenda. Now, I always lay my cards on the table, Glenn. And going back to what, what, what you were saying at the introduction of the podcast about how people define play or think of what play is and everything else is that, that, that we, we can't narrow it down. We can't reduce it because it's always going to be used in the context that people want to use it. And I always say, if you're using play to meet an outcome, okay, fine. You're being honest while you're using play. The question is always going to be, if it's in relation to children, they might not perceive it to be play, whereas you might as the adult, because you set it up for me an outcome yeah. and often if it's not meeting that outcome the adult will try and direct that play to it so it becomes very much an adult agenda you still can have a process of play there though but the, the aspect there and if we go with the colorado paper is they talk about um this sort of term adulteration and basically the meaning that you're using the play for the adult agenda as opposed to supporting the process of play as with a child agenda mm -hmm. so again it's not a criticism it's just a case if you're going to use play that way that's fine it's just that 
there's going to be different perceptions to play from children and adults. Now, with the play cycle, um, the original Colorado paper had um, six elements. And in 2018, when the Colorado paper was 20 years old, I've got a, a esteemed colleague of mine, Dr. Shelley Newstead. Um, it might be worth getting her on the podcast as well, um, Glenn. <laughs> and um, we were having a, an email conversation. And I just sort of said, look, I said, Colorado is 20 years old. How do people understand it? Because it, it was a conference paper. It wasn't a published academic paper. And I'm not belittling it, but it means that it hadn't gone through any sort of peer review or anything else. But 20 years, it become so popular. It underpinned professional practice in play work and child care. It was filtering into early years as well. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it forms the basis of the National Occupational Standards in play work. We've got eight play work principles and the play cycle is, is very much within that. But we sort of thought, well, what evidence is there? How is the play cycle from the original paper to now? So we did our own study. We did a survey. We did two, actually. We did one with play workers and one with childcare workers at separate times. And basically, we put the six elements of the play cycle and said, don't go to Google. Just tell us what you think these elements mean. Mm -hmm. And um, the original ones were the meta loop, play cue, play return, loop and flow, play frame, and annihilation. So we just said, what do these terms mean? And the long and short of it was that two of them, Metalude, Loop and Flow, people didn't grasp what it actually meant in relation to the original Colorado paper. So um, from the study and looking at how um, these elements were being portrayed in the uh, literature, we said, right, we, we need to sort of redefine them a little bit. So we got rid of the Metalude and we now call it the pre q So it's the idea and thought to play. People get that. That's what they were saying. That's what they thought it meant. That's what it was reflecting in a lot of the, the studies, um, the, the, the text that we were reading. And people didn't understand loop and flow. So we got rid of the loop part, but they understood flow. And flow is that element where you're lost in time. Mm -hmm. So when children are playing, we do that. Us as adults, if we're doing something that we enjoy, that's away from work, away from the stress of home life, we suddenly get lost. We forget about time and place and everything else. I'm, I'm, I'm a very keen runner. And I find that at times, particularly if I go on a long run, I get into flow. I forget about everything that's going on in the world. And my only focus is just doing that run. Mm -hmm. That's what play is about as well. So we've got these six elements now. And um, we've literally sort of still trying to do this research on, on the play cycle because it's still relatively um, untested in a way. Um, however, um, one aspect that, that I, I started to develop now is, is actually, can we record play cycles while we're in practice? And I've developed this uh, method called the play cycle observation method, or as my students call it, the PCOM. Mm -hmm. And out of the six elements you can't record the pre-cue because you can't see what's inside somebody's head you can infer it but you can't see it mm -hmm. and you can't really record flow because flow is a state and again it's more internal we can sort of think someone might be lost in flow but we can't ask them because as soon as we ask them they're going to come out of flow so you you, 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 you can't. but you can record the play cue the play return the play frame and annihilation. So basically the, the, the play cue is the signal to play. So if we were in the same room, I might throw you a ball. I've given you a play cue. Mm -hmm. Now, you might just ignore it and I get nothing back. Or you might catch the ball and throw it back to me. You give me a play return. So the play cue and the play return forms what we call a play cycle. Mm -hmm. And the play cycle is sort of contained in a space and it could be a physical space. So for example, my children used to make dens under the kitchen table. So I'd throw a blanket across. So that table became a den and it's a bounded space. It can also be sort of more psychological boundaries. So for example, a word game in a playground, it can happen 
and be moving around. You know, it, it, it's not necessarily a fixed place, but that's what the play frame is. The play frame contains the content of the play cycle. And then annihilation is when the play cycle ends. So that's sort of a, a whistle stop tour of sort of the, the, the history, how it's developed and where we are with it now. It's that bit as well, though, like, you know, you're talking about bits. I was I was talking to one of my colleagues earlier before I left work today. And we as soon as I, I said your name, she went, hang on, I know that name. And she Googled this. Oh, I did all this for my SVQ. And it was like, yeah, yeah, you would have done. Um, and we were talking about that because although, you know, I'm early years, but I've had some play work background as well. But for me, it's like the play cycle and like that play cue and the play return and everything else. It's kind of intrinsic to what we do as well, because play is that natural tool for learning. And like you say, it's that bit where for us as practitioners is trying to find that balance. So we're not adulterating the play and it becomes about us. It's about taking the cue from the children as well. Yes. Yeah. 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 No, you, you, you're absolutely right. And again, this, this goes back down to play is going to be used in different contexts. And sometimes it might be more adult led. Mm -hmm. um, if we think about um, the era of atypicality, um, there are examples where children may not be able to give a verbal or non verbal cue. So it would be down to the adult to issue that cue to see if a play cycle could be formed. Um, when we, when Shelley and I did our, our, our research, we also asked how people were using the play cycle and, and what impact it's, it's had. And again, this is our two separate studies, and we, we actually found there were similarities between the play workers and the childcare workers. And I think some of the early years um, workers got into the childcare study as well. And basically, they all said it changed practice. Mm -hmm. It made them aware of when to intervene and when not to intervene. It made them aware of thinking about, well, or wait to be cued in rather than go steaming in with a play cue. The other thing which was interesting was that um, they talked about how before they were sort of always um, having to react or respond to what they sort of termed inappropriate behaviour. And then I suddenly realised, well, actually, rather than inappropriate behaviour, are, are there play cues being issued and not being picked up? Mm -hmm. And so they sort of said that it made them actually change their practice as opposed to dealing, responding, reacting or whatever to what was sort of termed inappropriate behaviour into looking at play behaviour. And actually, is it a cue not being picked up because this is the thing with, with the play cues. If play cues aren't being picked up, they could be issued again and again and again. And if they're not being picked up, for some children, it'd be like, oh, well, that's it. For others, it can be frustrating. Yeah. And people would express their frustration in different ways, particularly mm -hmm. children. And it could be upsetting another game or rather trying to be involved in the game. But because... Children are already in their established play cycle. They don't want to interrupt it. Mm -hmm. So the skill of the adult is, right, let's try and get this person in the play cycle. And this is where, as an adult, it's actually good that we can issue cues. So mm -hmm. if we see a child who appears that they don't want to play on their own, because I think this is the other thing as well, is if children are happy playing on their own, leave them, they're in a play cycle. Play yeah. cycles don't have to involve other people they can involve objects and if the child is happy with the object that they're playing leave them alone that's not, that, that, that's sort of my, my my sort of bottom line if they want you cued in they'll give you a cue yeah. however for some children you might sort of think right actually i'm going to cue them in to play with form a play cycle and again from the practitioner side and i've i've, I've worked in 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 um play groups and and, and early years before I got in, in, into all this sort of um, um, theory side of things. However, reflecting back, I can remember where you get a child involved in a play cycle 
And often what happens is that when other children see a child playing with an adult, it becomes a magnet mm -hmm. and they get attracted. And the skill is then to think, right, how can I get myself out of this play cycle but keep it going with all the children? And that's where the sort of focusing on the play behaviour as opposed to the inappropriate behaviour is like, how can I establish a play cycle here? Can we get other people involved? Um, and the other thing as well, echoing what, what you were saying, Glenn, is that a lot of people were saying, well, this isn't actually new. We've been doing this for years. And it's like, yeah, but we've now given you a theoretical basis to actually say why it's important what you're doing, particularly um, if you're working with children, particularly in play work, the less play you do with children, the better, because children are self-directing and controlling and happy in their own play. From a, a potential adult perspective, it's like, look at those lazy people. All they're doing is standing around watching children play. They're not doing anything. Well, actually, we are. And this is another part of the play cycle is around about what the adult role is in supporting this process of play. Mm -hmm. And um, Sterrick and Else came up with a hierarchy of four. And the first one they termed play maintenance. And you're literally observing keeping play cycles intact, keeping them contained, keeping that play frame contained. And if you've got, you know, a play group, an early years group, anything else, you could have potentially 25, 30, 40, 50 children, depending on the ratio with adults. Mm -hmm. Goodness knows how many play cycles are going on. You can't be active in all those play cycles. And the chances are, at some point of the day, children are all playing all amongst themselves. But as an adult, we're taking that play maintenance role where we're observing, we're keeping them intact. If we can see possible disruption, we might intervene just to keep them intact as opposed to um, stopping them and everything else. Or you might see a child colouring, happy in their own play cycle on their own, and they suddenly realise they need a blue felted pen or crayon or pencil. So we might go to the adult try and see if they can find one or get one. And that's what we call simple involvement. We act as a resource to help keep that play cycle going. The third one's medial intervention. That's where we become an active player in a play cycle. So that example I said about throwing the ball to you and you threw it back, you're active in the play cycle. And then a more deeper um, interaction between the adult and the child is, is complex intervention. And we dip in and out all these interventions all the time. So we could be in medial intervention, but we're still observing other children playing. And this goes back down to it's giving you that theory to support what you're doing. So if anybody's saying, well, you're just standing around doing nothing, watching. Mm -hmm. I mean, provided you're not on your mobile phone making a text or something, and you're actually doing your professional work, you can say, well, actually, no, because I know there's a play cycle over there, and there's one over there, and there's three children over there. So you can demonstrate that actually you are, you know, and it's good for reflective practice as well. It enables you to reflect, well, what did I do with the children today? Did I need to intervene then? Why was I in, queued in for that one? You know, because the whole aspect, particularly with early years, whether it's in education, recreation, everything else, the process of play happens. And there is always going to be children playing on their own, children playing with other children, and children playing with adults. And it's Breaking down that, that, and this is where the PCOM, the place like observation method comes in, breaking those elements down can get you to reflect on, right, what was my involvement here? What type of high uh, intervention did I use? Did I need to use that intervention? Could I have done another intervention? And this is where I think from the original paper coming out and people applying it to practice is this, we've been doing it. And we've been doing it in very you know different contexts. And we're just now developing this as, as I say, as a tool to actually help and aid practice even more. I think so as well. Listening to you talk there as well. So you know, we, we've had a lot of new starts at my setting. And obviously I, I've been out supporting my team because we've had so many new starts. Um, but it's been interesting to sit and sort of I've been reflective with them and watching 
what they're doing. And there is, there's those bits where, so our, our established children have been off doing their thing and the staff are just keeping an eye on them and watching what they're doing. And, you know, they're off playing their own game in their own little groups. But our newer children, that's where they've kind of started, the, you know, the, the team have started the play cues with the newer children because they're unsure of what to do. And it's it's that bit where I think we, we're now giving the staff the language to understand yeah. what they're doing. They've always done it, but it's, yeah. it's necessarily the, the language that they need. And that's where this is, you know, being so helpful that actually – this is what I'm doing. I'm not just standing around doing nothing or I'm, you know, I'm I'm just playing with the children. Well, yes, we are, but we're doing this for a specific reason. And, you know, the, the language, it's the, the tools, it's the labelling that goes with it. Absolutely. And, and, and I think the, the thing with, with the, the process of play, the play cycle and everything else, I'm making it as though we're supporting the children in their play. It's actually, we're supporting their control. We're supporting their autonomy, but mm -hmm. we're not taking it over. And that's where the, the, there's a fine line, because I think the other thing with the play cycle is that they can last seconds and they can last months. And what I mean that is that sometimes you'll have children in um, your setting and literally they go from one play cycle to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. They don't seem to be able to sort of spend enough time or want to spend enough time on doing one thing or one activity. I used to run after school clubs. Mm -hmm. And again, this is before I got really got into sort of the, the, this aspect of, 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 of the play cycle and everything else. But reflecting back, I can always remember I had one particular child. Um, they were quite young, I think about five years old. So the, the after school club had four to 11 year olds. Yeah. And, um, I learned very quickly that I had to get everything out because I knew that they would go from one thing to the next, to the next, to the next. And if we didn't have enough things out, and this goes back down to reflecting about, yeah, it's play behaviour, they would start to sort of try and engage in other people's play cycles, but actually will result in more aggravation as opposed to acceptance. Um, what was also interesting, though, was that whenever the child played with me as the adult worker there or uh, any of my staff, they seemed to be engaged in longer play cycles. So, again, it's actually a positive thing, adults being involved in some contexts, because actually for some children, it, you know, but I think they quite like that one-to-one, -one. whereas a lot of the other play cycles... Um, may have involved um, more than one child or, again, it's just this case of, well, actually, it was just seconds. And, you know, for, for me, again, reflecting back, this is where the theory of loose parts is so important. I don't know if you're familiar with the theory of loose parts. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it, 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 it's a case of, well, the more things you got out, the more variables, the more things that children can do, there's more chance to um, develop uh, children to develop um, the play cycles. And we I actually um, looked at this aspect of loose parts and the environment and, and this concept of affordances. And, and um, we, we, we're now sort of trying to develop the um, theor theoretical side of the play cycle to sort of look at, well, how important is the environment? And actually, the environment is really important because what the environment can offer is what some um, is, is termed a perceptual cue. And basically, a perceptual cue is what can we perceive from the environment? Mm -hmm. And actually, the perceptual cue, the objects, whether they're fixed objects, movable objects, I include people within the um, environment, um, what do we perceive? And it could actually stimulate the pre-cue. So going back to this girl, having all these objects meant that at least there was potential external cues for them to pick up on that could create and develop into a play cycle, taking into account they weren't going to last very long. Mm -hmm. On the other side, and you've probably seen it yourself in, 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 in your settings, Glenn, is children will play something which might take up the whole session and then they have to go home 
But when they come back the next day or the next time, they pick up for where they left yeah. before. And this is where the play cycle can last months because children can come back, pick up where it's left on, and it might develop in a slightly different way mm -hmm. because in an established play cycle, children are still issuing cues and there's always returns. That's where the concept of flow comes in, is that flow enables cues and returns to keep happening, but it's actually still an established play cycle. So, you know, I, I, I think going back to the implications to practice, it means that it gets the, the, the process of play, not just looking at how children are playing, but actually how is the play environment resourced? Mm -hmm. How does it actually set up to enable the pre cue to be sort of, I suppose, stimulated through the senses to get this idea to play, which then can result in a play cue being emitted. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. It's like, you know, you were saying there as well about, you know, how the play cues can last months and uh, and everything else. No, and the, the play cycle can last months. Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, the play cycle. But, it, yeah, I was keep thinking back to my own practice and like some of the children that have been coming to us this week some of our new ones and we made a change to one of our outdoor spaces so we we've got because we're an outdoor setting we're an outdoor nursery so we have an indoor space but we're outside for 90 percent of the day um and we've got this new great big pipe thing but we put it up on tractor tires so it actually is a slide as well so they you know we can get adults through it and everything but one of our new children just found the balls and started rolling it down. Yeah. And that, that was on their first day. Then they came back again and that's what they wanted to do again. And they remembered it and that's what they wanted to continue doing. And it was just like, well, that that's brilliant because he's remembered it and come back in. And it's become a kind of, not so a source of comfort as such, but it's just become something that he's becoming familiar with. And it's like, you know, that's his starting point and that's what he wants to do. And it's like, well, that's great. He knows where the things are. He knows what he wants to do. And off he goes. Absolutely. And and it's fulfilling their playmates. Mm -hmm. And and the whole aspect with, with, with the play frame and having it contained, so actually literally having the resources of, 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 of um, the ball, go down the pipe, at some point it's going to lose meaning or interest to the child. They can choose when to annihilate it. Yeah. You know, and, and uh, I think that's great. I think I think that's really nice because you've given a really nice example of what, what I've, I've sort of just sort of been trying to unpack a little bit. I mean, as I say, I think it's a concept. It is so simple. But actually, when you are, when you unpack it and delve into it there, there's so much that's going on and i think that's what makes it such a fascinating this is why i mean it's taken up probably 15 20 years of my life now Glenn. you mm. know and, and, and i'm just in a lucky position where i can um look into it in, in a little bit more detail do the research with my colleague develop the, the theory side but i've also got um i'm i at swansea university i'm, I'm the program director for the um master's program in developmental therapeutic play mm -hmm. and our students are doing their dissertation at the moment and with I, I will be completely honest with you with no coercion at all glenn mm -hmm. but i've got two students who are using the pcom for their dissertation mm -hmm. one of them and i'm really pleased about this because i think this is a little gap with the play cycle and everything else is a lot of my research has been what we can term around sort of basically focusing on typically developed children. But how does the play cycle relate to atypicality, particularly ADHD and autism? And I've actually got one of my students who wants to do their um, dissertation using the PCOM with a setting that support children who have been diagnosed with ADHD and autism. So that's taken in, a, in another direction. Mm -hmm. I've got another student who um, is analysing um, videos of animal assisted play. So he's looking at the process of play, the play cycles between a child and a dog. Mm -hmm. And again, this is the thing about, well, when you focus on the process of play, you can use it in any context. Yeah. And what I would say is anybody who's, um, you know, interested or watching is is well we need to develop and think about the play cycle in as many 
context where play is happening. So if anyone's got any thoughts or ideas, I mean, more than happy to get in touch with me. That's brilliant. I mean, the thing is as well, it's, you're saying about picking away at it and actually you do. I mean, for, for me, I've been in this for nearly 27 years doing this kind of work. And there's bits that like I just, I do it. But now it's good to know that actually there is theory, there is something yeah. behind it. I'm not just doing it for the sake of doing it, but yeah, this is why I do it. And I think it it gives a sort of strength to play that actually there is theory, there is there is reasoning behind it, and this is why we do it. This is why we champion play. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and I think the, the nice thing as well, particularly where I'm based in Wales, is that the Welsh Government um, have produced a curriculum for the non-maintained sector, so mm -hmm. the nurseries, the playgroups and everything else. And I uh, was part of the university with the other universities in Wales. We, we, we got together with the Welsh Government and I said, look, I said, the only thing I can bring to the party is the play cycle. And I explained the play cycle. Um, it's now in the non-maintained curricula on how to support children's play. So. We are actually here in Wales. We've got it into the early years. It, it, it's starting to, you know, and, and within the policy and the guidance. Mm -hmm. And um, we're, we're working on the second stage now on, on looking at, at this guidance in relation to some supportive um, videos. Um, but what's nice is the fact that, well, OK, it started as a conference talking about play work. We're now getting into the realms where actually it does support childcare, but also it does support early years mm -hmm. as well. And I think this is where, you know, it, hopefully it's going to be a springboard, you know, a bit like, you know, yourself coming to the workshop, listening, inviting me here. It is great because it's, it, it, I don't want the play cycle to be something that's protective to play work. No. That's where it developed from. However, it's something that actually will, it's, it's, it's the concept, it's a process, and we've got evidence now that we can record it. But um, when, when I was doing the PCOM, um, I first piloted it with um, uh, my students using watching a video. Mm -hmm. And that's how I got them all watching the same video to see are they recording the same things. And we've got a lot of um, similarity. I actually did a second pilot with some colleagues in um, University of Central Oklahoma. So I went, lucky I, was, I went out to visit them and um, they got um, a play group on the campus and they got an observational booth because their students can then as part of their course. Mm -hmm. So I talked to a couple of my colleagues. Said, well, how about if we try and pilot the PCOM in real time? So we actually piloted it in real time, but we actually did it with um preschool children mm -hmm. so it, it's it's one of these that actually well we've tested it out but we've tested it out with older children on video but preschool children and we got again the two people who were the observers got similarities so that's how we know that as a way of recording the play cycle it's, it's actually quite a reliable and valid way of doing it but it's not a measure it's just recording Mm -hmm. the aspects of the play cycle but again i think that one helps reflective practice two it helps you get again a bigger understanding of the play cycle but actually also thinks well what's the implication on, on the environment is there things that are actually i'm seeing play things issue but there's no return it's actually saying with the environment it's not enabling the returns so it's getting you to sort of think about the bigger picture of the whole play environment the resources the people and everything else and actually sometimes it there might be something in the policies or procedures that's actually preventing mm -hmm. play cycles you know so it, it, it has things that relate directly to practice but also indirectly as well absolutely well Pete, unfortunately, time is against us and we've reached the end of the podcast. But thank you so much. It's it's fascinating. And, you know, the fact that, you know, play is well, I mean, we've said it play is paramount, but there's 
there's proof that it's there and we should be using it and celebrating those play cues when they're given to us um, is absolutely brilliant. So Dr. Pete King, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks for inviting me.